Okay, good afternoon, everybody. If you can take your seats, we're going to start. Um, I can hold the curtain for a couple of minutes. If people are still well, this is this is a I great uh, this is a great day for us because this is the have, first uh, talk of the Nathanson uh, Legal Philosophy Series, Legal Philosophy Between State and trans Transnationalism, that is held while uh, the Ontario Legal Philosophy Partnership is in existence between uh, York, uh, the York uh, Philosophy Department, Osgood Hall Law School, and uh, the McMaster University Philosophy Department. And we're very thankful to have many uh, distinguished guests from McMaster uh, today. There's an aura of a royal wedding here today. <laughs> And we actually have royalty with us here today. <laughs> Claudia, an icon of uh, the world of moral philosophy, Claudia Card. Mm -hmm. Claudia Card is the Emma Goldman Professor in the Philosophy Department at the University of Wisconsin in, in, Ma in Madison, where, where she's taught for more than uh, four decades. Uh, she also has uh, teaching affiliations in four uh, interdisciplinary programs, namely uh, LGBT studies, women's studies, Jewish, Jewish studies, and environmental studies. In 1996, she was chosen by the Society of Women in Philosophy as the Distinguished Women Philosopher of the Year. From 2002 to 2007, uh, she was Senior Fellow at the Institute for Research in the Humanities. Her books include The Unnatural Law Tree, Character and uh, Moral Lock, The Atrocity Paradigm, A Theory of Evil, the Cambridge Companion to Simone de Beauvoir, Genocide's Aftermath, and uh, most recently, Confronting Evils, Terrorism, Torture, Genocide. And she's currently, uh, and I hope this is still up to date, but the president of the Central Division of the American uh, Philosophical Association. And she's at work on a third volume in her trilogy on evil, uh, this one to be uh, on surviving atrocities. And we're getting a primer of this book today. Uh, the initial thoughts that are going to be in the book. We have two respondents today for such a distinguished speaker, and the first respondent is Professor Alice McLaughlin from the York uh, Philosophy Department. Alice is an assistant professor, soon to be an associate professor. Uh, we're going for tenure in the same year, so that also applies to me, but uh, in the philosophy department here, and she completed her PhD at uh, Boston University, and she's also studied at Queen's University in Kingston, where she, from which she holds an MA, uh, and at Cambridge University uh, in England. In 2006, she was a research fellow at the Institute uh, for Human Sciences in Vienna, in Austria. Her main areas of teaching and research are theoretical ethics, especially feminist ethics, uh, virtue ethics and moral psychology, social and political philosophy, and the work of Hannah Arendt. Her current research topics include forgiveness, resentment, and the role of moral emotions and reconciliation. So today we have a talk uh, entitled Surviving Long-Term Mass Atrocities, U-Boats, Catchers, and Ravens by Claudia Card. Uh, unlike uh, some of her previous talks, because we have such a distinguished speaker, the talk is going to be uh, for a bit longer today. The talk is going to go for about uh, 15 minutes, Claudia tells me, and then uh, Alice and I are going to go for our short responses, and then we'll open the floor for questions for the rest of the time. So, Claudia, is the, that the, the mic? floor is yours. No, the mic is on you. Oh, I, so we you, don't... You have your own. Okay, okay. <laughs> well, may you live in interesting times. So goes the proverbial Chinese curse. And here we are. So I offer you a preview of the issues to be taken up in volume three of my trilogy on evil. The topic is survival of long-term mass atrocities. First, there are conceptual issues. What does survival even mean? Second, there are ethical issues. What is morally at stake? in surviving long-term mass atrocities. I will make some suggestions about both and tell you some stories of U-boats, catchers, and ravens. The moral costs and burdens incurred by many survivors present meta-survival issues. They problematize the judgment that one has survived. The atrocities I have in mind, mainly 19th century to the present, include genocides, slavery, concentration camps, and prisoner of war camps run by captors who did not regard themselves as bound by Geneva Conventions. I set aside single event and short-term mass atrocities, such as the bombing of Oklahoma City and the Tokyo subway gas attack, both in 1995. A longer duration offers room for more complex responses, strategizing, learning from mistakes, choices of how or whether to try to survive, 
to hide, resist, flee, or comply with oppressive demands. Grim options become many survivors' moral luck. The Nazi Holocaust is the most fully witnessed, documented, and studied long-term mass atrocity from the points of view of survivors, many of them educated, articulate, keen observers, and conscientious recorders. And so what might otherwise seem a disproportionate number of my examples are from the Holocaust. This imbalance has advantages. Holocaust memoirs are rich in reflections on the ethics of survival. Also, I know more about Holocaust atrocities than about other long-term mass atrocities. My course on moral philosophy and the Holocaust includes a unit on deliberations of the Jewish councils of elders, the Judenräte, and memoirs of individuals who survived long enough to leave a record. I undertake this project with trepidation and humility. I am neither a mass atrocity survivor nor the child of one. Any advantage my position might have for objectivity may be outweighed by epistemic and emotional disadvantages of lacking a more intimate acquaintance with what I want to think about. But the concept of survival and the ethics of survival deserve more attention than they have received from analytically trained philosophers writing in English from a secular point of view. Survival in that tradition has meant either survival of the grave or survival of the fittest. My interest is in the survival of individual human beings on earth, many of whom cannot reproduce because of what they endured. I do not much engage the question which survival choices are morally defensible. My interest is in both defensible and indefensible choices. Often it is clear enough which are which. In other cases, I am relieved not to have to judge. Lawrence Langer refers to the choiceless choices of Holocaust victims in situations where every option makes one involuntarily complicit in moral horrors of one sort or another. Ethically more interesting than how survivors decided which options to take when confronted with choiceless choices is how they responded later to the options they took. My first two books on evil set a background for addressing survival, although I did not know that I was embarking on a trilogy when I wrote them. The atrocity paradigm defined evils as reasonably foreseeable, intolerable harms produced by culpable wrongdoing. So defined, evils have two irreducibly distinct elements, harm and the agency that produces it. This definition combines an Epicurean view of evil as suffering with a Stoic view of evil as residing in the will. It takes as basic the noun evils, plural, and treats adjectival uses of evil as derivative. Not all wrongs are evils, only those that do intolerable harm nor are all harms evils, only those produced by culpable wrongs. My approach is secular, and it avoids ideas of metaphysical forces and demons. An animating concern for me has been to counterbalance the nearly exclusive focus by philosophers and others on perpetrator psychology. I want to highlight the plight of victims. My work on survival picks up on the last chapter in the atrocity paradigm on what Primo Levi called gray zones. In gray zones, victims who accept positions of power over others become complicit in the very evils they endure themselves, slave overseers, for example, or Jewish police officers in the Nazi-created ghettos. Some survive, or do they? What does survival mean here, and what is its value to survivors? My second evil book, Confronting Evils, is inspired by the ideal of preserving humanitarian values in responding to evils, threatened or real. That ideal is violated by interrogational torture of terror suspects. The responders I had chiefly in mind were relatively unencumbered agents who were concerned to protect and defend policymakers, for example, not individuals who were in immediate danger. Thinking as a policymaker, led me to revise the agency element of my definition. I substituted inexcusable wrongs for culpable wrongdoing. The resulting definition of evils is reasonably foreseeable intolerable harms produced by inexcusable wrongs. 
Inexcusable wrongs include wrongs for which no one can, can plead reduced responsibility. But more interestingly, they include wrongs that lack any decent moral defense or significant partial justification. Evils are indefensible from a moral point of view, whether or not anyone is culpable. This revised definition applies better than my earlier one to institutions, practices, and structural evils. The idea of lacking moral defense preserves the contrast of evils with natural catastrophes to which the idea of defense does not apply, and it refines the contrast of evils with lesser wrongs. I turn next to specific conceptual issues regarding the meaning of survival. Surviving refers both to an activity and to what remains. I want to preserve that ambiguity. It allows us to ask meaningfully whether a survivor has truly survived. So let's begin with the idea of true survival as contrasted with mere survival, barely surviving, just plain survival, or surviving but with qualifications. Like Aristotle's and Kant's true friendship, true survival is an ideal, well, of sorts. Under some interpretations, it's an ethical ideal. <clears throat> Picking up on the ambiguity of surviving, there are two ways to understand true survival. One is by the means of survival, a survivor's skills, determination, and the like. Think of that as skilled survival. The other way is by what survives, what is preserved, recoverable, or reparable. Think of that as preservation survival. Consider first skilled survival. Luck is always a factor, but some are called true survivors because of roles their skills actually played. At issue is what the survivor deserves credit for, not necessarily moral credit. The starkest contrast is with those who lack the skills but survive anyway by sheer luck. There are many possibilities in between. Impressive survival skills can be insufficient, or survival may be due to luck rather than to skills one actually possesses. Preservation survival requires one to come through with mental and physical health in basically decent shape, or basically reparable or recoverable. Dying within hours, days, even weeks of liberation is not true survival if death was brought on by the atrocity, nor is losing one's mind irrecoverably. The starkest contrast to true preservation survival is being alive, but not for long or with not much of a life. Langer cites a former death camp inmate who observed that one can be alive after Sobibor without having survived <coughs> Sobibor. Insofar as moral health is part of mental health, this ideal is partly ethical. Again, there are degrees. It is tempting to see some less than true survivors as analogs of Aristotle's friendship of utility and pleasure. Less valuable than true friendships, these affiliations can still have value, and one way to survive is by making oneself useful to perpetrators. Examples will come later. Another is to make oneself attractive, offer pleasure. But whereas friendships of utility or pleasure often deepen into true friendships, bonding with one's oppressor endangers one's integrity. True survivors need not be attractive or useful to perpetrators. Some employ neither strategy. But survivors of utility and pleasure are proof that a true survivor in the first sense, skilled, need not be a true survivor in the second, well preserved. In long-term mass atrocities, true survival in either sense is apt to be rare, yet these concepts suggest norms for judging oneself a survivor in any sense. In long-term atrocities, a survivor often designates those who live through to the end or to some liberatory event and then function at a decent level. But survivor is also applied to victims who are functioning well enough that it is not yet clear that they will succumb. Those whom Auschwitz prisoners called Muslimener, Muslims, were alive but not surviving, although it seems some recovered and did survive. Um, uh, Muslimener is an unfortunate term. Agamben proposes, I'm going to read you a footnote here, that the most likely origin of Muslim as camp jargon is the literal meaning of the Arabic word Muslim, the one who submits unconditionally to the will of God. And the operative idea here would be <coughs> unconditional submission. So although that term is an unfortunate one, the concept of the walking dead needs to be acknowledged. 
Alexander Zolchenitsyn, Ivan Denisovich likewise observes of certain prisoners in the gulags that with their attitudes, they were not going to make it. Of special interest are victims who are functioning well enough that Denisovich's observation is not warranted. With illness or accident, survival can mean simply being alive at the end. When the papers say there was a plane crash and so many survivors, that's all they mean. Yeah. With atrocities, more is required. Here, survival is like passing a test. This is so even for surviving grad school or probationary employment. Strictly, what survived grad school, a primary election, or probationary employment are one's candidacy and opportunities. They are what remain viable. But viable here is metaphorical. Candidacy is not an organism. Surviving here is also hyperbolical. Death of one's candidacy is not comparable to the mortality of an organism. Yet surviving retains a literal connotation of success or victory so far in what might have meant defeat. When losses drain success of satisfaction, survivor goes in scare quotes. Or with Langer, one might refer to former victims rather than to survivors. Survivor is judgment laden in that it discriminates among those who live through an atrocity. Only those who were wronged and might have died from it or worse are survivors. As its intended or likely victims, their position is involuntary. They tend to lack the options and history of choices of perpetrators, collaborators, and bystanders who could also be said to live through it. But survival is a relative concept because it is always of some events and by someone. Those who are perpetrators, collaborators, or bystanders in relation to one atrocity can be survivors of other atrocities in which they did not play those roles. Yet the question arises whether victim collaborators should also be regarded as survivors of the atrocities in which they collaborated. They are less free than other collaborators. This is an issue to which I will return. Surviving suggests living beyond something that is or was fatal for many, or was intended to be, or might have been, or something comparably grave, torture, for example. Surviving grad school is hyperbolic insofar as it suggests you might have died. Yet there need be no hyperbole in rape survivor, domestic violence survivor, or torture survivor, even if the victim was not actually or yet in mortal danger. These predicaments easily become fatal, although not always predictably in the individual case. Among non-collaborators, what sorts of relationships to an atrocity enable one to count as a survivor? If you escape physical harm by fleeing, hiding, or passing as someone who is not a target, are you surviving? Or have you escaped the need to survive? Consider some cases. Hannah Arendt fled Germany for Paris by way of Czechoslovakia and Switzerland, the year that Hitler came to power. She had been arrested for her research activities on anti-Semitic propaganda. In 1940, she was interned at Camp Gour in the south of France, where many died or were deported to Drancy and from there to Auschwitz. She escaped Gour, made it to Lisbon, and in 1941 found safe passage to the United States. The same year that Arendt fled Germany for Paris, Albert Einstein fled Germany for the US. Two years later, Rudolf Carnap, with the help of the late Willard Van Orman Quine, fled to the US from Czechoslovakia, where he had held a university chair. Of these fugitives, Arendt is most clearly a Holocaust survivor. She survived the occupation and Gur at a time when she was in danger of being deported to Auschwitz. Einstein's and Carnap's emigrations were anticipatory. Thanks to the Allied victory, they escaped rather than survived the Holocaust, although they may have survived atrocities leading up to it. Many flights during the Holocaust were not emigrations. Rudolf Verba and Alfred Wetzler escaped and fled from Auschwitz in 1944 and tried unsuccessfully to save the Hungarian Jews. They were survivors, fugitives, resistors, and attempted rescuers. Captives who jumped or were pushed from death trains, as did Ruth Altbecker Cypress and her toddler, and fled or hid in occupied territory, enduring terror and hardship until the war's end, were survivors as well as fugitives. What about long-term hiding that endures to the end? 
Here are three examples. First, Harriet Jacobs hid in North Carolina in the 1830s from a slave master who had sexual designs on her. He refused to sell her to friends who wanted to purchase her freedom. She hid seven years in a three-foot-high attic, barely sheltered from the elements by a layer of shingles before she received safe passage to the North and escaped from slavery. Second, the late French philosopher Sarah Kaufman was for three years a hidden child in Paris during the occupation. She and her mother avoided deportation thanks to shelter in the home of a Catholic widow. The widow asked Sarah to call her Meme. Meme christened Sarah Suzanne. Through much of that time, little Suzanne felt happy. Third, from May 1943 to July 1944, Ignacy and Paulina Cheeger and their children endured filth, stench, malnutrition, and cold as they hid with six companions, all Jewish, in the sewers of Lvov, Poland, to avoid the death trains. They nearly drowned. Others did. Jacobs, Kaufman, and the Cheeger family totally escaped capture by hiding until liberation. Yet, as targets of oppression, all endured major harms and losses. Harriet Jacobs was a slave for two decades before she went into hiding, where her health deteriorated permanently. Kaufman lost her parents very prematurely, her father to Auschwitz, and in a different way, her mother through Meme, who undermined Kaufman's attachment to her mother and to Judaism. The Cheeger family's health was permanently compromised also. They endured illness, accidents, and near detection in the sewers, and a close brush with death in the ghetto before they went into hiding. Jacobs became an articulate abolitionist and published her memoir in 1861 under the pseudonym Linda Brent. She survived, although her health did not. Kaufman eventually detached from Meme and recovered her attachment to Judaism, but never to her mother. The year Kaufman published her memoir, 1994, she killed herself. Did she survive almost 40 years? Was she not truly surviving even then? The Cheeker family and fellow survivors purchased a small business after liberation for their rescuer, Leopold Socha, a Catholic Polish sewer worker who had brought them food and supplies daily and kept watch over them at extreme risk to himself. Socha's story is also interesting. Formerly an undistinguished criminal who had done prison time, he encountered phenomenally good moral luck in opportunities that enabled him to pull himself together and become a hero. He overcame temptations that could have prop profited him materially. He persisted faithfully in his rescue activities when nothing remained to reimburse him. He died in 1946 in an unrelated road accident, a true survivor of the Third Reich. Passing as someone who is not a target is a way of hiding, hiding in the open. Resistors and rescuers like Socha and Mame passed as compliant citizens. Hidden children like Kaufman passed as Christian as did some like Cyprus who jumped from death trains. Passing raises questions I have explored in the context of sexual orientation issues. The dangers are not only betrayal and exposure, but complicity and worse. What must a passer do to prevent exposure? Can passers avoid betraying targets who do not pass? There are different cases. Is the passing temporary? Are there contexts in which and people with whom one need not pass? If passers remain alert to opportunities for sabotage, noncompliance, and resistance, they preserve some integrity. The need to pass can be humiliating, but need not diminish one morally. Long-term total passers, however, risk becoming what they were pretending to be or splitting into selves with incompatible norms, values, and attachments all of which they may be loath to betray. And then who is passing for whom? Who survives? A well-known story of passing during the Holocaust is that of Solomon Peril. His memoir, Europa, Europa, is also a prize-winning film. As a teenage Jewish refugee in Russia, Peril fell into the hands of invading Germans. He convinced them he was an ethnic German. He then fought in the Wehrmacht. He lived not only in terror of being depanced, but in personal ethical turmoil. 
writing his memoir years later became an important survival strategy. Perl had to survive not only the Third Reich, but his own long-term deceptions as well. Passing only briefly does not pose comparable issues. In 1848, light-skinned Ellen Craft escaped slavery disguised as an invalid white gentleman traveling north to consult doctors. Her darker-skinned husband posed as her servant. Their ordeal was harrowing, and they were certainly slavery survivors. But they did not confront the same survival issues as were faced by those of mixed race who strove to maintain a long-term white social identity. Solomon's Peril story brings to mind military combat veterans. Some survive atrocious POW camps, but should we regard war itself as an atrocity? There are excellent reasons to find it an indefensible institution, even though it can be justifiable or even mandatory for an individual or a nation to engage in it. Civilians in war-torn areas are often mass atrocity survivors. Arguably, so are many combat veterans who were conscripted, even if conscription is the least undesirable practice to build an army. Suicide and domestic violence among veterans are increasingly recognized issues. In the free world, a conscript's term of service has been relatively limited, but it has still been long enough to give rise to moral setbacks and impose major burdens. Jonathan Shea, psychiatrist to Vietnam veterans, finds physical violence insufficient to explain the post-traumatic stress disorder that he treats. He finds, in addition, grave violations within the soldier's own unit, such as betrayal by a superior officer, especially if it resulted in or was followed by the death of a buddy, and then the fraggings consequent on such betrayal. Fragging, portrayed in Oliver Stone's film Platoon, was Vietnam combat slang for assassination of a military superior or officer. It peaked in Vietnam in 1971 with 333 confirmed incidents and another 158 possible ones. Shea believes grave violations of what soldiers take to be legitimate expectations lie at the root of moral character breakdowns from which the soldier's recovery is usually incomplete. He finds confirmation in Homer's Iliad. Achilles goes berserk after betrayal by his superior officer and then Patrocles' death in battle. Patrocles' death, Shea notes, is insufficient to explain Achilles' response. Combat death is not unexpected. Achilles survived not only expected horrors from the enemy, but betrayal within his own unit as well. Whether or not war itself is an atrocity, many veterans do survive atrocities within war. <clears throat> what about children of survivors? Harm to survivors does not necessarily harm their children who are born later. It can have opposite effects, but it presents trials for that next generation. What children survive is not the same as what their parents survived. Survival is not transitive. Atrocity survivors must have lived through at least part of it. But children survive domestic violence that has roots in parents' military traumas. Not only children suffer, in a group targeted by genocide, everyone can be impacted, and for more than one generation. Through nightmares and fears based on what they have heard, children can experience vicariously what their parents survived. Revisiting his early life as the child of survivors, Art Spiegelman writes in Mouse 2, I did have nightmares about SS men coming into my class and dragging all us Jewish kids away. He recalls, when I was a kid, I used to think about which of my parents I'd let the Nazis take to the ovens if I could save only one of them. Vladek, Artie's father, moans in his sleep. And Artie remembers, when I was a kid, I thought that was the noise all grown-ups made when they slept. By now, one might ask, what turns on survivor status? Does it matter whether children of survivors are survivors? or those who hide, flee, or pass. Well, it matters to those who embrace survivor status and to those who reject it or are ambivalent. What turn on it are the values at stake in survival and how it was that one escaped being killed. There are several issues. We can mostly set aside reparations issues. In the case of American relocation camps, 
for residents and citizens of Japanese ancestry during World War II, all and only survivors who could document their internment were lawfully entitled to compensation in the U.S. by Congress's Civil Liberties Act of 1988. For compensation, all that seems to matter is what you endured wrongfully through no fault of your own and that you are alive, not how well preserved you are. Yet it matters to reparations for some atrocities whether you became a collaborator. Victims later convicted of criminal collaboration can lose entitlement to material benefits of survivor status. Even though their status as victims was involuntary, their collaboration is in tension with certain honorific connotations of survivor. For those who are not defeated by long-term mass atrocities, Survivor may sound like a status to own with pride. Many are ambivalent about owning that status when they feel shame at what they endured or did or did not do. When pride is at, is at issue, it matters not just that you suffered wrongfully and are still alive, but also how much of yourself and what in yourself you preserved, how well you are doing. Testifying as a witness is potentially an aid to recovery of self-respect by enabling survivors to contribute to truth and justice. It can also encourage mourning of losses. As in the case of Solomon Peril, it can reinforce one's identity and help put one's choices into perspective. Victims tend to be uniquely positioned to witness the harms of a long-term mass atrocity that they experience directly. Yet what victims endure can also block or destroy their ability to testify. Levy wrote, we, the survivors, are not the true witnesses. The true witnesses, he said, did not return or returned mute. Yet, if the ability to testify survives, motives to conceal what one did or suffered complicate testimonial reliability. Collaborators not yet tried for their crimes have powerful motives for concealment. Non-collaborating victims may be reluctant to reveal past humiliations over time, with appreciation of what others also suffered, motives for revelation can outweigh motives for concealment when the issue is humiliation. Analogous transformations are less likely in collaborators who have not stood trial, and as we will see, even in some who have. Survivor status is also embraced for simpler reasons by political activists. Survivor can sound like a winner, relatively speaking, and victim a loser or a quitter. So heard, survivor sounds like praise or congratulation, although of an unenviable sort, and victim a term of derogation or pity. Thus, feminist critic Naomi Wolf deplores what she calls victim feminism, contrasting it with power feminism. And a YouTube video available last July showed a survivor dancing with his grandchild at Auschwitz. True survivor in relation to long-term atrocities is ordinarily meant as praise. Yet what survivors win needs scrutiny, and victims should not be heard as derogatory or pitiable. Many non-survivors were not quitters. They were at critical moments unlucky, unsupported, or betrayed. Some chose for good reasons not to survive. And so I turn to the ethics of surviving. <laughs> Critical choices for survivors arise at three stages, in anticipation of the onset, through the duration, and during the aftermath. Earlier choices can affect the availability or eligibility of later ones. I focus for now on the duration, issues of noncompliance, silence, resistance, escape, loyalty, deception, even complicity. Unlike collaboration, complicity need not be culpable but it is morally risky in the temptations it creates and in the self-deceptions it makes likely. The ethics of survival is a sensitive topic. Many are ashamed of or ambivalent about what they did to protect themselves or what they did not do to protect others or protest. Some conclude retrospectively that certain of their choices are not ultimately defensible. Many judge themselves more harshly than anyone else would have a right to. I have no interest in blaming, but neither do I strive for ethical neutrality. To gain perspective on the ethical costs of survival, 
I find no adequate substitute for reflecting on the responses of people who actually face dangers no one should have to and that I have never faced. Memoirs and testimonies are invaluable. Next best are biographies based on in-depth interviews. Like Artie, we can imagine what we might do or suffer were we in such predicaments. But can we learn from others' experience? It is tempting to say, as Langer often implies, that we cannot learn anything ethically significant that we did not already know. Yet the same might be said of studying rape. Who does not already know that rape is wrong? But that kind of judgment centers the perpetrator. If we shift attention to the experience and agency of victims, we might gain ethical insight into their moral luck, the nature of the violation, what challenges they face, and what becomes of their character. In the time remaining, I reflect on choices four Holocaust survivors tell us they made or witnesses reliably report them to have made. And then I conclude briefly with an ancient issue regarding who is harmed the most by evils. Two of the survivors are women, two are men. For three, having to choose was disastrous moral luck that generated further survival issues. The survival of at least these three is compromised. One appears not to have survived her moral setbacks, although she lived a long time. Another appears to have survived better than anyone could have expected. About the third, I have many questions. The ethics of self-defense ordinarily takes for granted a reasonably coherent self with a tolerably coherent welfare to defend. In criminal law, Self-defense justifies using force only against another who is reasonably perceived as an unjust aggressor and only as much as needed to protect oneself and its bottom line needs. Long-term mass atrocity complicates this picture. Rationality has less to work with in systematically deceived agents who have reason to believe that they're systematically deceived. Their control of consequences is severely diminished. And which bystanders are innocent? What force excessive? More troubling, victims' agency and sense of self can come apart into fragments that do not cohere well with each other. I do not mean that the victim's ability to act is destroyed. Although moral paralysis is possible, fragmented selves can also be capable of very sophisticated action. But who is responsible for what a fragment does? It becomes ambiguous when what is, being defend, what is being defended and by whom. The agent is liable to lose perspective on what is worth defending. Consider U-boats in Berlin who became catchers, the German word is Greifer, for the Gestapo. U-boats were submerged Jewish fugitives who lived on the streets without a star or in hiding while the Gestapo agents were rounding up enemies of the Reich for transportation to Theresienstadt or an extermination camp. To become a catcher, one accepted a deal from the Gestapo. Your names will be removed from the transport lists for as long as you are useful in bringing in other U-boats for transport. The Gestapo armed catchers with guns. Many captured U-boats refused that deal. Some betrayed by catchers might otherwise have survived. Some who were not betrayed did survive. And we know as much about catchers as we do because some who were betrayed survived anyway and testified later. In 1943, beautiful 20-year-old Stella Goldschlag became a catcher. Blonde and blue-eyed, passing as Aryan, she was a U-boat until a catcher betrayed her. More than once, she escaped the Gestapo's clutches they recaptured her and tortured her each time by beatings for information they erroneously thought she had regarding the hiding place of her acquaintance, the forger, Gunter Rogoff. She did not know he had escaped to Switzerland. Finally, after her parents were rounded up while she was in prison, broken from beatings, she negotiated a deal. Take my name and my parents' names off the transport lists and I will catch U-boats for you. In the end, she saved only herself, if she can be rightly said to have saved herself. At first, Stella pretended. She let old friends escape when she was not being watched. But her biographer, Peter Wyden, reports that she formed an attachment to another U-boat turned collaborator, 
Rolf Isaacson, and that under his influence, her priorities changed. She became a skillful catcher, widely feared. She continued after her parents were transported and she knew they had died. Wyden relies on interviews with survivors who knew her, some betrayed by her, some who testified against her. At her po post-war trials, Stella admitted only to searching for Rogoff and denied everything else. She served 10 years in Soviet prisons. She was convicted again in a German court. That sentence was suspended for time served. When Wyden found her in the 1980s, Stella was living on social security and life insurance from the third of four husbands. She considered herself a Christian. She seemed to believe the denials she had maintained for so long. With Wyden, she maintained an affectionate, almost gay demeanor. Yet he reports that her routine was to leave her apartment only for a solitary daily meal and otherwise live behind drawn curtains. Her only child, a daughter raised by others, would have nothing to do with her. Stella Goldschlag's moral luck could hardly be more opposed to Leopold Soch's. Both were at a point in their lives where they had not developed good character. His options offered him a chance to develop integrity and become, over many months, one of the best selves that he had the potential to be. Hers offered her no comparable opportunity, fairly immediate, virtually certain death or collaboration. Resistance possibilities depended on whom she knew or met. Pretending bought her some time, but not enough for radical character change. Socha had enough time to reassess his values and habits, although to be fair, some of his skills as a criminal served him well as a rescuer. Becoming a real catcher developed Stella's worst traits. It allowed her a limited self-esteem as she became good at it, but it developed a self hard for anyone to live with. Even she could do so only by systematic self-deception. The person she became would also be virtually impossible for her to overcome without miraculous luck, which never happened. Stella had many skills of a true survivor in the first sense. She was creative, courageous, persistent, and a risk taker. Yet, although she experienced severe anti-Semitism and gender bias, she never learned to evaluate either. With better luck, she might have. Wyden says her family lacked the resources and connections that enabled his own to emigrate, so Stella exploited her ability to pass. She might have succeeded had she not been betrayed, but she then discovered on being tortured that her looks were not going to save her. Sizing up her opportunities, she made herself useful. Ultimately, she recovered a life of making herself attractive to men with comparable values. That virtually sealed her development. But her persistent denials suggest that she could not endorse her past. That continuing need for dishonesty may be the best thing that survived in her. Shortly after the Anschluss, which was 1938, the now world-famous women's historian Gerda Lerner, then Kronstein, was imprisoned in Vienna, hostage for her father, who was arranging from outside the country for the family's escape. She came to terms with death at age 18. She writes, one can survive by either having hope or by settling with the likelihood of one's own death. I did both. I thought of death and how one must choose. We all must die and we do not know when or how, but we can choose to live unafraid by being ready to die. So fortified and not knowing how long she might be in prison, she created a school and a regimen for her cellmates. She campaigned for her release to take an academic exam. Under questioning, questioning by an SS officer, she revealed that she had researched the German ballad, although she had no idea he was an expert on that. Her release from prison was just in time for the fortuitously postponed exam that would set a course for her future. She was able to emigrate, another story. Luck was with her, but it would probably not have sufficed. She is a true survivor, both senses. As of this writing, she is 90 and still publishing. Four years later, that was 1938, prisoners faced grimmer options. Philip Mueller, Czechoslovakian and Jewish, born the same year as Stella, told himself on arrival at Auschwitz, 1942, some of the same things as Professor Lerner. He writes, we must all die. Death was, after all, part of our lives, 
and we would have to face it sooner or later. But he adds, these considerations were quite futile and failed lamentably either to stifle or dismiss my fears. His predicament was unimaginable. Death awaits us all, but not torture. Assigned to the Zonderkommando, a special squad for crematorium duty, this 20-year-old former player of the violin screwed up his courage and became determined to learn everything possible about what was going on. Miller calls those who worked the ovens crematorium ravens. He became a master raven, the longest enduring raven of them all. Unlike the Berlin catchers, crematorium ravens were almost never in a position to decide who would live and who would die, except themselves. They were complicit in the deception of the showers, but they did not betray anyone who could have survived. Still, in July 1944, Levy reports 400 Jews from Corfu, assigned to the Zonderkommando, refused to do the work and were immediately gassed. Others committed suicide. Some buried testimonies in cans, earthed, unearthed years later. The 12th Sonderkommando blew up a crematorium in October 1944 in a plot to which Mueller contributed. He supplied maps. That group were killed, but took some Nazis with them. Mueller was routinely alert to covert ways to sabotage and resist. It is not hard for me to understand why other Sonderkommandos did not take the route of the courageous Jews from Corfu. Grabbed as they stumbled out of the cattle cars, disoriented, dehydrated, dazed, many were deceived into thinking they had been chosen for an elite job, deceptions that might not have worked by 1944. Once undeceived, they could reasonably fear that overt resistance could get them thrown into a furnace alive. Mueller records that the SS did that to at least one raven who tried to warn prisoners in the undressing room that the shower room was really a gas chamber. After the family camp from Theresienstadt was gassed, Mueller, recall he was Czechoslovakian, felt that his own further survival was meaningless. He entered the gas chamber determined to share the fate of others. But two young women pushed him out, urging him to survive to bear witness, which he did at the 1965 Auschwitz trials, in his memoir, which was originally published in 1979, and in interviews by Claude Lanzmann for the documentary film Shoah. Did Mueller truly survive? His skills were phenomenal. His memoir is a major testimonial. But what did he preserve of himself? Lacking Stella's capacity for self-deception, he carries a past that is a torment. He lost his family and the social context that had given his life positive meaning. Auschwitz gave him no space even to grieve. Yet he never identified with his oppressors. His capacity for moral assessment deepened through his vigilance and resistance efforts. His memoir preserves a morally sensitive account of the Zonderkommando, as well as of others' heroic deeds, and still others' crimes in which he played no role at all. To a greater extent than anyone could have anticipated, Philip Mueller survived his own survival. Last is 43-year-old Hungarian Jewish physician Miklos Nishli. He arrived at Auschwitz in May 1944, two years after Mueller, and was also chosen for the Zonderkommando. Mueller, who was young and physically robust, had been assigned heavy labor. But Dr. Nishli, who was neither, stepped forward when Josef Mengele asked for physicians. After questioning him, Mengele picked him to be chief physician in the Zonderkommando. Dr. Nishli performed autopsies on twins and dwarfs murdered for Mengele's experiments in racial science. Nishli's services, skills, and diligence would not have been easily replaceable. He reported on what he found in autopsies that might interest Mengele. He kept meticulous records for Berlin. He not only made it his goal, he says, to persuade Mengele that he was too valuable an assistant to gas, he became that assistant. With greater mobility, privileges, and discretion than the Ravens, he got assistance to his wife and daughter, also prisoners, and they all lived to be reunited. What did Dr. Nishli preserve? He kept himself and his family alive. In his book, 
he invokes the goal of exposing Mengele's crimes as his justification for diligent service to Mengele, and he hopes for redemption thereby after the war. Flawed as an account of Auschwitz, Dr. Nishli's book is still a unique source on Mengele, but at what cost did Dr. Nishli live to write it? How much did he need to redeem? What would his redemption even mean? Bruno Bettelheim, in his polemical foreword of 1960 to the English translation of Dr. Nishli's book, deplores Nishli's choices, but is convinced of his honesty. By then, Nishli had died. Yet insofar as Dr. Nishli's goal was to expose Mengele, he needed to confess just enough of his own role to explain how he knew what Mengele did. What does Dr. Nishli not tell us? In his admitted eagerness to impress Mengele, how far did he go? What became of the identity of the man who became Mengele's assistant? Did Dr. Nishli develop a double self? Psychiatrist Robert Lifton proposes based on his interviews with former Nazi doctors, that those doctors developed a separate self for camp life, distinct from the self they embodied at home, each with its own values. Lifton offers this idea to explain how doctors could function in both worlds, not as any moral excuse for what they did. Nazi doctors had options that Dr. Nishli lacked. Yet the question arises whether, as Mengele's assistant, Part of Dr. Nishli identified with Mengele, while another part went into limbo. Did he bond with Mengele, as victims are said to do in the Stockholm or hostage syndrome? Doubling, as Lifton presents it, appears to be radical dissociation without amnesia. Is doubling just another term for long-term comprehensive passing? If so, which self is passing? Do they both pass? Does Dr. Nishli pass as Mengele's too valuable to gas assistant in the camp? And then does the valuable assistant that he became pass as Dr. Nishli, who was in limbo at Auschwitz? Which self wrote Nishli's book? At Gorkius 469 and following, Plato has Socrates argue that it is worse to do wrong than to suffer it. Not just morally worse, but a greater harm. Wrongdoers, he says, are unhappier more miserable than the wronged. For expediency, let's call the question who is more miserable, the Gorgias question. At issue is not who feels worse, but who is more harmed, the wrongdoer or the wronged. The Kantian in me has long said to Socrates' answer, absurd, wishful thinking at best. Would that Nazi criminals were as harmed as the Muselmänner they produced. Even Hannah Arendt, who once thought totalitarianism made victims and perpetrators alike into automata, changed her view about that at Eichmann's trial. Eichmann remained shamefully and shamelessly all too human in his very inhumanity. Suppose, however, that we compare not a voluntary wrongdoer with an involuntary victim, but instead two victims, one complicit for survival's sake in wrongs to the other, in gray zones, victims who accept power become complicit in the very evils they suffer. They risk losing perspective, scruples, compassion, integrity. Complicit survivors can fragment into selves with incompatible norms and values, as in Lifton's doubling or Stella's systematic self-deception. They can internalize norms hostile to what is best in their former selves. Is that a worst harm? than the deaths of victims who refuse complicity? An affirmative answer is not absurd. On the value of survival, I note, although it is not decisive, that long-term atrocity survivors do not speak with one voice. Like many combat veterans, many Holocaust survivors, Sarah Kaufman, Jean Amery, Tadeusz Borowski, Bruno Bettelheim, and it is widely believed, Primo Levi, have killed themselves. Suicide might result from the victory of one fragment of a fragmented self, or from depression or pessimism about world politics. Yet some suicides occurred just after publication or reissue of a memoir that reflects a balanced view. Something reminiscent of the Gorgias idea lingers in the thought that, owing to the moral burdens of survival through complicity, splitting, or moral paralysis, 
survivors risk saving a life worse for themselves than death would have been. Yet here the distinction between wrongdoer and wronged at the heart of the Gorgias question is no longer sharp. Some wrongs put others into situations in which staying alive requires wrongdoing or ceasing to care what is right. And so I end with a post-Holocaust Gorgias-inspired question. Which harm is greater? To become inhuman like Eichmann, at the same time remaining shamefully, if also shamelessly, human, or to be utterly dehumanized, use, losing hope as well as self-respect, joining the walking dead, the Muselmanner. The Gorgias view suggests that one whose humanity is perverted without being extinguished is more harmed than one whose humanity is extinguished without being perverted. The fallout from evils, like the radioactive fallout from nuclear disasters, contains the very real danger of contaminating what it does not kill. The late Robert Nozick observed that humanity's disappearance from the planet would not be as regrettable as it might have seemed before the Holocaust. On a more local scale, there may be lessons for nations regarding the value placed on security by victims of terror. In designing policies to further the survival of national groups, we should reflect on what survival would mean, what would remain, for example, and what its value would be to those who remain. Thank you. Well, thank you, Claudia, for a very careful and thought-provoking expose. Uh, I would ask Alice to share her, her thoughts with us. <clears throat> so that thing does work after all. Apparently. <laughs> um, thank you very much, Francois, and thank you, Claudia, especially. Um, it is my very great pleasure today to be asked to comment on Professor Claudia Card's thoughtful and moving talk. In her striking and illuminating remarks, Professor Card has given us a glimpse of what will, we've been told, be the focus of her third book in a trilogy on evil, atrocity, and morally complex geographies that emerge in its aftermath. In this new and latest task, as Card herself has mentioned, one can find echoes of previous work on topics such as the development of character under conditions of bad moral luck, the question of agency in moral gray zones, her analysis of genocide as a kind of social death, and the power of victims to offer or refuse forgiveness. But the connection here, or the development, is not only thematic. Those of us who know Claudia's philosophy will recognize a familiar and admirable approach at work as well. In each of the cases I have mentioned, Claudia turns to a familiar debate and refuses to take a side in an ongoing discussion, but instead asks us to look somewhere or to someone else picking up a single, apparently unremarkable premise or concept, and then unpacking its conceptual and moral significance, leaving many of her readers, such as myself, both convinced of its philosophical salience, while equally important, also invited to re-examine why we missed its significance, why we accepted the terms of the debate, and furthermore, why we didn't listen for the voice or look for the perspective that would have uncovered it. The previous points of debate are thus transformed. Now perhaps the example of forgiveness makes an especially useful parallel to the present discussion. Claudia was not the first philosopher, contemporary philosopher, to take up the question of the unforgivable. But while others sought to determine if and when persons are sufficiently culpable or actions sufficiently heinous that their forgiveness would be forbidden or at least unjustified, Claudia Card begins from the premise that the capacity be to bestow or to refuse forgiveness is a moral power, and asks instead when and how someone becomes empowered to forgive and what the limits of that power might be. She thus turned our attention to a figure who had been rather shockingly overlooked, the forgiver herself, and she reoriented the question of forgiveness around the forgiver's agency, her choices, and her responses to those choices. Here, we can see the same approach at work and the same motivating move to turn us towards the agency responses, uh, choices and responses of survivors rather than perpetrators. And it's worth pausing for just a moment to emphasize how unique and important this unyielding focus is among philosophical discussions of evil. Moral philosophers who do discuss evil tend to focus on the psychology of those who commit it, 
or its place, the place of evil in abstract rational systems of moral theory and theology. It's rather astonishing, given how unimaginable experiences of intolerable harm are to those of us who haven't felt them, that the agency and experiences of those who suffer evil are taken to be A, presupposed and understood, and B, to be of little interest. Indeed, they are seen as philosophical constants in an equation where the most interesting variables can be found elsewhere, and are thus best left to psychologists, trauma counselors, and filmmakers aspiring to an Oscar. So, <laughs> what does Claudia Card have to say about survival? In this talk, she takes a term that could easily be seen to connote little more than temporal endurance and delicately opens it up, revealing, ambi revealing ambiguities between activity and preservation, not to mention the impossibility of ascertaining just what activities we ought to be focusing and what ought with, from within or without to be preserved and what qualifies as a minimum of such preservation. She touches on the differing textures of survival, including fleeing, hiding, passing, becoming complicit, or living in relation and proximity to others damaged by evil, as the children of survivals do. And she gently points out the costs, dangers, and risks, both moral and material, of each path. What emerges is a picture of uncertainty, threat, dislocation, risk, hardship, and fundamental compromise, sometimes chosen, sometimes enforced. In other words, conditions that are highly inhospitable to basic human and moral agency, to say nothing of autonomy. And at the same time, her probing narrative and analysis of the choices and strategies taken by individual survivors reveals just how clear it is that many survivors are complex, if compromised moral agents, struggling to retain autonomy and identity to build, or to build it anew, against the contamination she references in her final lines. Now, I want to say just a very little bit about some of the conceptual and ethical issues that Claudia raises, and then maybe end with a couple of questions for her. I think it's important to notice the development she takes from initial conceptual issues, that is, when someone is or becomes a survivor, what sorts of things are survived in the relevant sense, and what kind of relationship or experience you need to have in relation to them to become a survivor, and what hangs on who is or isn't a survivor. She references the potential moral status or standing of survivors, noting the experiential and moral ambivalence of the term, its political usefulness for activism, and its epistemic complexity. The latter is especially interesting to my mind. Survivors may play a crucial role in witnessing or testifying to practices of evil, although the requirement that they do so may place an unbearable burden on them, and it may not even be possible for them to do so. Here I was reminded of Charlotte Delbo, Susan Bryson, and Judith Butler's various discussions of post-traumatic agency, and the difficulty, sometimes impossibility, of reconstructing a self who is capable of telling stories. And at the same time, the term survivor, when placed on someone, plays an epistemic role in helping others understand and contextualize the survivor's own choices. And then finally, Claudia ends by discussing the ethics of survival. And she, perhaps rightly, demurs from making moral judgments about the rightness or wrongness of individual strategies. Instead, she asks what we can learn from the experience of survivors. In doing so, she expresses the desire to find a middle way between ethical neutrality and blame, concluding instead with what she calls the Gorgias question, the perversion of one's humanity through the perpetration of evil or its diminution and extinction by contamination with evil. And then she complicates that question from us, sh for us, shifting the contrast from perpetrator to victim to two varieties or kinds of survivors. Now, my respect and enthusiasm for Claudia's work should be fairly obvious, but I would be a poor commentator if I ended without a challenge of some kind. So I'm going to limit myself to three, keep them brief, and you can take up whichever you like. Perhaps the others will reemerge in discussion. First, I'd like to ask you a little bit more about the ideal of true survival. I think you are right to distinguish between survival as a goal, to which a victim of evil might aspire, and mere or bare survival. But at the same time, I wonder about the normative baggage that comes with this claim. In erecting ideals, even ideals to which no one would ever be in a position to want to aspire, we do create normative paradigms, and almost inevitably, we expose or emphasize the possibility of failure. Is there a danger that speaking of ideal survival places yet another burden on survivors who are, 
as you so beautifully describe it, making choices to get by? How might we qualify or cushion the ideal of survival to appropriately defer and attend to the needs of would-be survivors? And I'd add, does the gorgeous question reemerge in the ideal of, sur of ideal surviving? Is there a potential necessary conflict between mm. moral ideal survival and psychological or mm -hmm. health ideal survival? Mm. My second question picks up on the remark, with illness or accident, survival can simply be mean being alive at the end. And I suspect this question is largely clarificatory. I take it that you draw the distinction to draw out the particular obstacles or tests in the wake of misfortune caused by human agency. But I found myself wondering if simply being alive ever qualifies as true survival, even in cases of illness or accident, especially given the social conditions of illness and of its survival in an ableist society. I thought here also of the potential critical use of your work to discuss the use of survivor rhetoric in cancer, especially breast cancer discourses, mm -hmm. and the connotations of victory, battle, enmity, and triumph it contains. While I take your point that there is much that is unique about surviving institutions and practices of evil, I wonder if you see some of your analysis applying to these survivors as well. Mm -hmm. And finally, and Francois is being very generous here, I'd like to push you just a little bit further to sketch out the space that you want to dwell in between blame and ethical neutrality when you turn to the ethics of surviving. I take your point that you have no interest in sorting between the good and the bad survivors or creating a kind of purity test for survival strategies. And I appreciate your emphasis on learning from and understanding survivors' experiences rather than preemptively judging or even categorizing them absolutely. But I'm reminded, too, of survivor Hannah Arendt's warning about the moral and political dangers of refusing to judge. Mm -hmm. And given her criticism of complicit Jewish councils, for example, we could well read her to mean the dangers of refusing judgment in general, and not just judgment of perpetrators. So I wonder what kinds of eventual and presumably informed and appropriately deferential judgment you envision in the space between blame and neutrality. I know that in previous work, you and also Lisa Tessman have taken moral risks like this in drawing our attention to the moral damage of oppression and its detrimental effect on the characters of the oppressed. That is the idea that one of the damages of oppression could become that we become less good as a result. And certainly that analysis could be seen to, in some sense, blame the victim, although you and Tessman are clear that that's not what you're doing. And at the same time, recent work by Bernard Boxall and more recently Carol Hay have argued that there exist moral responsibilities to resist oppression, even when such resistance is futile. So I find myself wondering, while we may need to resist from blame, can we resist from ascriptions of responsibility, ascriptions even of certain responsibilities or obligations that arise in contexts of survival? And do you foresee yourself finding a place for discussion of something like these responsibilities in your work? And what might these responsibilities be? These are three questions. I look forward to any of them. But mostly, thank you so much for coming to York. Thank you very much, Alice. I always like commenting on book projects, because there's always so much on the table. And it makes the work of the commentator easier, in a way, because it's impossible to just pick on some topics that one wants to discuss. And, Boy, this is a really thought-provoking paper. One thing that I find uh, particularly remarkable uh, about Claudia's paper is, is the following humble acknowledgement. Early on in the paper, she recognizes uh, that she is neither a mass atrocity survivor nor the child of one, and therefore that she is at the, a significant epistemic, and perhaps even more importantly, emotional disadvantage when thinking about her topic. She also contends that this, this positional disadvantage may very well not be outweigh, outweighed by the greater objectivity that distance may arguably provide her. Now, in my view, really, that's the case that too few uh, analytically trained philosophers writing in English, to use Claudia's expression, would have this kind of realization, or at least m make it explicit, even in relation to a topic as complex, a topic that's as charged as the one that she uh, tackles. So I'm curious to know how much Claudia thinks that her positional disadvantage really impacts her analysis. In our beliefs and our emotions, we really capture uh, various aspects of the world, and arguably by relying on reliable first-hand historical accounts and testimonies, as well as 
biography is based on in-depth interviews, as she puts it. Well, Claudia is able to develop a, a relatively reliable web of beliefs about, about survival, in which she can couch a helpful conceptual and at least to some extent a moral analysis. But what about emotions? What about their role in the methodology of analytical practical philosophy? It may well be true that emotions are partly constituted by beliefs, but it's also widely thought that there is, that there is more to be captured in the world that, that can be captured in, in beliefs, um, even in the beliefs that are the ingredients or, or partly the ingredients of, of emotions. There's more than just the way things are quite believable. That is, it's widely thought that there are aspects of the world that are only properly captured in complete, and here I want to say, you know, fully affect-laden, and even wishful uh, emotions, as opposed to simply cognitive emotions, as Martin Nussbaum, for example, would, would want to have uh, them. Now, of course, I'm not denying that the possibility of vicarious emotions exists. I'm simply trying to take Claudia's disclaimer seriously and understand what limitation, limitations it poses for her project. So, for example, she makes a genuine effort to use real-life examples and to try to be as true as possible to the psyche of her subjects. Now, unlike many other moral philosophers, she's also careful not to rely too bluntly on her own intuitions, although it seems that they still play a role when comes a time of really knowing what is true and not true or, or survival. Now, so far as such uh, methodolog methodological limitations are sound, then are they sound as a function of this particular topic or this particular perspective that she has, or this class of topics or perspectives? Or are there really more general constraints about how we should be doing moral philosophy? And that, that's my first question for Claudia. Now let's move on to some substantive issues. Well, the idea of survival that uh, Claudia uh, focuses on is the idea of survival to evil, right, to atrocities. Uh, it's a normative idea which implies more than staying alive. It's a judgment-laden, a moral idea, an ethical idea, which implies, as it were, the passing of a test. Right? That's an expression that she uses. Only those who were victims of an atrocious wrong, Claudia tells us, uh, and might have died from it or suffered an even worse fate than that, yet managed to remain alive in basically decent shape and to preserve some, some unspecified, let's say sufficient degree of moral integrity in the process, are true survivors. Now I say degree because, as Claudia mentions at, at one point, I think importantly, there might be degrees of survival. So her, her idea of survival discriminates among those who live through atrocities, but it does not necessarily do so sharply. It may not uh, necessarily be, be a, a make or break category. Now I also have conceptual problems with uh, the category as Claudia fleshes it fleshes it out, does it really exclude survival to illnesses or, or accidents or, or even to, say, natural catastrophes that are life-threatening? Uh, right. uh, I also question the move which consists in, in, in tying up survival with atrocities, if atrocities are to be equated with evils, as Claudia defines them, that is, reasonably foreseeable, intolerable harms produced by inexcusable wrongs. Now, I can imagine a scenario uh, in which someone, let's say X, attacks and seriously harms and, and psychologically traumatizes for, with lasting effects another person, let's say Z, while under the mistaken yet reasonable uh, and, and perhaps also somewhat foreseeable impression that Z is attacking him uh, and that she, X, is acting in self-defense. Now it seems to me that Z, who remains alive and over time recuperates sufficiently from his or her life-threatening injuries and psychological trauma, uh, may well also qualify as a true survivor even if the wrongful and harmful attack was, were, were excused. Uh, it also seems to me that this is the case even if the excused wrongful and harmful attack is not endemic or prolonged, even if the recovery itself is prolonged. Uh, so, so, so these are some of the conceptual worries that I have. Uh, now, the more normative level, uh, I've always, have, uh, I've always have had uh, or been uncomfortable with the claim uh, which is apparently central to Claudia's work uh, on evils and survival, that, that there are wrongs that 
are unjustifiable or excusable even in principle. I don't want to go too much into this because I think it is the topic of our second book, which I haven't read. But one reason for my discomfort is, is the following line of argument, which is usually associated with Derek Parfit, that is that one can always imagine a scenario in, wi in which one needs to commit uh, well, and may be justified in committing and the fortiori uh, excuse a, a certain wrong in order to avoid more and or worse commissions of the very same wrong. Uh, so I always took it that to say that a certain wrong is unjustifiable or inexcusable is really only an emphatic way of saying that the relevant justifying or excusing circumstances don't in fact obtain. It's not to say that they never imaginably uh, could. Now, uh, I would need to say a lot more to, to justify or, or to make out this claim uh, fully. I just wanted to put it on, on the table uh, at this point. Uh, but furthermore, let me just accept the possibility of inexcusable wrongs and, and, and take uh, Claudia's argument on, on, on her own terms. If a wrong is inexcusable, uh, then and, and notice the, the, the possible awkward implication of the way in which uh, Claudia uh, sets up the problem of survival. That is, against the background of evils which are themselves granted in ex inexcusable wrongs. If a wrong is inexcusable, then arguably complicity or collaboration in its commission is also inexcusable. And if that's true, then any of the responsible individuals whose stories Claudia narrates to us, who are collaborating or somehow are complicit in the perpetration of inexcusable wrongs for the purpose of surviving, are themselves inexcusable wrongdoers who bear the mark of evil. At best, it seems they are evil survivors. If that is even a possibility, and not an oxymoron, given you'll remember Claudia's moral integrity threshold for, for true survival. It may be that, that the point about degrees of survival can be helpful here. I don't quite know. Now, now in many ways, Claudia seeks to, to resist the category of, of evil survivors, and I think quite right. For first, she, she really wrestles with many uh, morally difficult and ambiguous examples of people who are getting involved in one way or the other in atrocities as means of their purported survival. And she then posits a distinction between cases of collaboration and cases of mere complicity by stating that complicity, unlike collaboration, need not be culpable. Perhaps that Claudia wants to leave some space for excused accomplices of inexcusable wrongdoing. But it seems to me that if that distinction is to hold, well, more needs to be said about what it is, what it is that can morally insulate in such a tight way some accomplices for the purpose of survival from the inexcusable wrongdoing. Now, one move that seems to tempt Claudia is what I'll call the, the negation of responsibility move. Uh, indeed, she speaks of Jews participating in Nazi schemes for the purpose of survival who develop fragmented or double selves, selves that are dissociated from their normal selves and who are actually the selves participating in the atrocities. Claudia also speaks of conditions in which, and I quote, rationally has less, rationality has less work uh, as less to work with. She also speaks of moral paralysis. Now, this is not the language of responsibility affirming excuses like duress, like provocation, like mistaken justification, and so forth. Rather, it's the, it's the language of responsibility denying defenses like automatism, diminished responsibility, mental disorder. Uh, to be sure, it seems to me that disassociated selves or diminished, responsi diminished res rationality is not language that belongs in the assessment of someone who is a complicit agent in wrongdoing, of somebody who remains able to respond to reason and answer to it, of somebody who has what it takes to survive qua rational and moral human being. So I'm not convinced that this negation of responsibility road is the road to take to explain how some people may be able to truly survive atrocities while being no stranger to them. Yet I also agree with Claudia that we want to be able to recognize and perhaps sometimes even to praise, or at least to use another concept that she invokes, uh, not to blame entrepreneurial uh, purported survivors who, uh, although they got their hands uh, dirty in some way, to some extent, persevered and outlived uh, evils that were directed at them uh, in, in the first place. I would suggest that perhaps a better way to get to that point is to loosen up the connection between true survival and the kinds of strong evaluation and blaming which have been assumed uh, by the discussion we just had. And at one point, Claudia herself recognizes that this uh, may not be uh, the appropriate road, right, the strong evaluation road. 
Now, admittedly, the kind of relaxation that I'm talking about uh, seems hard to achieve without, without losing the moral dimension of the idea of survival to which Claudia is, I think, again, rightfully so attached. Uh, alongside related possibilities of positive moral evaluation, of praise, of credit for survival. Let me end by suggesting one possibly helpful move, I don't know, which would consist in deflating the notions of blame and blameworthiness or culpability along lines such as those suggested by Finn Scanlon, uh, his relational account of blame. Scanlon says, to, to claim that a person is blameworthy for an action is to claim that the action shows something about the agent's attitudes towards others that impairs the relations that others can have with him or her. In term to blame a person is to judge him or her to be blameworthy and to take your relationship with him or her to be modified in a way that this judgment of impaired relations holds to be appropriate. Now such a move might allow Claudia to keep the moral component, the, the, the non-ethically neutral component of survival that is so central to her account without being forced to get bogged down in the, in the condemnatory, in the disapproving, even the punitive kind of questions she wants to resist. Uh, it may also make it possible to make judgments, including self-judgments of survival that vary in degree without risking condemning people who were faced with uh, atrocious fates that no one should uh, ever uh, have been uh, confronted with. So this is what I had to say, Claudia. We have about 40, 45 minutes. So what I would say is why don't you pick up on a few themes for about five, six minutes, and then we'll just open to the floor so we can have a, a discussion. Okay, I might take a little more than five or six minutes. You've both raised some um, wonderful questions for me to, this will help me as I develop some of these projects in my next book. Um, first, let, I want to address um, the questions since I actually have them right out here before me that uh, <coughs> were raised in the first um, comment. In thinking about true survival, I wasn't thinking from the standpoint of the person who's trying to survive and what um, norms they might aspire to live up to. I was thinking from the perspective of somebody who's saying of someone else, that's a true survivor. You know? Now, of course, there are norms involved in that um, preservation survival concept insofar as part of what um, one would hope to keep is one's moral integrity insofar as possible. And I am working toward that at the end. And I'm, I'm uh, although I begin with the perspective of somebody who is judging someone else to be, this is not, I take it, a moral judgment, a true survivor, necessarily a moral a true survivor or not. As the paper moves on, I take more and more the perspective of the person who is surviving or trying uh, to survive. <clears throat> I didn't foresee that someone might read it that way that I was Im imposing. But it, in fact, uh, by the end of the paper, I think that there is a burden that I want someone who's faced with the question whether to survive or not to assume. Mm -hmm. I want that responsibility of um, not abandoning the responsibility to judge and discriminate between morally acceptable and unacceptable means of survival and not to forget to think about whether or not it's going to be worth it. Will the life that you have when you survive have been worth the moral cost of getting there? Um, the second question that you raise, you pick up, uh, and it's also both of you raised this question, what about surviving things that are not evils? Yes, um, you can. Um, make many of the same points about surviving something like breast cancer or surviving an assault for which the perpetrator is not to blame and so forth. What I was thinking is simply this. When the newspaper reports there was an accident and there were so many survivors or there was, as recently, um, in the United States, a Holocaust and there were so many you know, who did not survive, all they mean by it is who's still alive. Yeah. Um, and sometimes that's what people mean by it. But I, I, I grant that you're, you're both right that a lot of these distinctions, have you got a life that's worth living at the end, can be raised about survival of other things besides evils. Yeah. Um, I th thought the um, most interesting, Alice, of your questions is the third one that you raised about uh, what sort of ethical neutrality 
I don't want, or <laughs> what yeah. sort of, you know, um, there. I wouldn't describe it as a space between blame and ethical neutrality, because I don't think of this as sort of lying on a continuum, you know, um, here. But really, I want to, um, the place where I don't want neutrality is I want to be able to talk about the moral costs of the choices that survivors make and the moral burdens, the responsibilities they may incur as a result of the, co of the choices that they made. And with respect to the, the blame issue, which both of you um, mentioned, I'm, it's, it's not that I don't think it's possible to blame. I do think it is, but I'm not interested in doing it. And I think this is partly an ethical choice. I don't think it's my place to do it. it. It might be someone else's place to do it. It might be the place of one survivor to blame another who made it harder for them to survive. But I don't think it's something I'm not interested in doing, and I don't think it would be ethically appropriate for me to do it. But it's not that I think it's conceptually uh, uh, problematic. Um, and so, let's see now, there were some things. Oh, yes, um, I wanted Francoise to pick up on uh, your first question, insofar as methodological limitations are sound and so on and so forth. Um, I think, you know, what may be in the background of this thing that I do is what Rawls calls appreciating the burdens of judgment. Um, of course, I mean, one in reading empath uh, memoirs and um, interviews and so forth, you do learn to empathize with what you haven't experienced directly, and your emotional uh, repertoire grows and so forth. But it's important also, I think, to recognize what Rawls calls the burdens of judgment, that everybody brings to something a different total life experience. And that affects the way in which they assess their options, the weight they attach to various things and so forth. Um, and I want to be sensitive to that, particularly in such a sensitive issue as, uh, as these are. Um, <clears throat> about the tests, I, I was writing in the margins as you were speaking. Uh, <clears throat> oh, um, to go back then to the application of some of these issues to people who are surviving things like cancer. Uh, both of you mentioned uh, that one. I think that um, what's distinctive about surviving an evil or an atrocity is that it has a family of distinctive moral tests. And uh, the moral costs of things that you do are different, but enough like each other with respect to surviving moral atrocities that it's, uh, it's worth treating them as a distinct set of, um, set of issues. <clears throat> And oh, about excuses. There's something that I, I spend a lot of time in my second book talking about what I call moral excuses. I distinguish metaphysical from moral excuses. The metaphysical ones diminish responsibility. And uh, uh, the moral excuses are simply reasons that explain what you did, but they don't carry any moral weight. And what I claim there, um, that you didn't know this, you didn't have access to it, but what I claim there is that a reason that might carry moral weight for some purposes, in some circumstances, might carry no moral weight at all for other purposes in other circumstances. And I think with that distinction, then uh, some of the issues that you uh, raise could be, uh, could be dealt with. Um, <clears throat> there was something else about those excuses. What was it? And about complicity uh, on uh, collaborations. I wasn't thinking of excuses and talking about complicity and collaboration. I just, um, the thing is. It just you refer to complicity as being I, yeah. something that can be non culpable Inexcusability arises in describing the evil that somebody is surviving. And somebody who is complicit may or may not be culpable. I, the reason I wasn't thinking about excusability or inexcusability in relation to what the survivor is doing is because that concept is particularly relevant to the issue of blame. And I'm not interested in that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so. Well, that's probably enough. I should stop and let open up the discussion. So open the discussion to the floor. Mm -hmm. What we would ask is that if you can circulate the microphone or stand up and come and speak at the microphone. So, Professor Dimmer, do you have a microphone? Mm -hmm.
Uh, thanks for that talk. It was terrific. Um, it seems to me that in light of the discussion that's just gone on, that um, all of the work is being done um, by the moral burdens or the moral costs, especially mm -hmm. to moral integrity of what survivors might do if you want to maintain that distinction between surviving evil and, and surviving other mm -hmm. kinds of harms. Um, because mm -hmm. you, you have the same um, set of judgments possible about someone who survives a car accident um, and is diminished mm -hmm. in various ways, suffers various ongoing harms as a result. But for you, that wouldn't be a parallel situation because there's no moral diminishment, right? So it seems to me that... Well, in I wouldn't go so far as to say there's no uh, moral element there, but uh, I think the moral tests are different. There can be moral tests in other cases, but I think the, the moral tests of surviving long-term mass atrocities are kind of distinctive. Okay. Um, my, my question really goes beyond your paper, so if you don't want to deal with it, um, feel free to just ignore me. Um, but it, it was really about whether you have any views on responses to ma mass atrocities. Um, and given, given your um, mm -hmm. emphasis on first-person narratives um, from survivors, mm -hmm. um, whether you have, in particular, any views about the appropriateness or not of something like the International Criminal Court to deal with these things, or truth and reconciliation processes, or other alternatives. Thank you, I do. In fact, what um, motivated my, my second evil book was an attempt to think about responding to long-term mass atrocities without perpetrating further atrocities. And uh, there's only one place in this paper where I think I allude to that, I say that uh, responding to terrorism by torturing suspects, you know, to get information out of that, fails woefully to live up to the ideal of preserving humanitarian values. I do think that it's important to preserve humanitarian values in responding to atrocities and not to become an atrocity perpetrator oneself. Hi. It's so nice to hear all three thoughts. <laughs> Unless you're this? saying not to use this mic. No, is the, is the microphone on? Yes. Yeah, Sounds on. Okay. Sorry. Not at all. Uh, I appreciate all three papers, but it is going to be a question about Claudia's uh, near the end of your paper. Um, you said uh, uh, your answer to your own version of the Gorgiasian question um, as to who's more harmed, that it wouldn't reduce to who feels worse. Mm -hmm. But then your answer was the person who retains some humanity, however perverted, is more harmed than the person who does not. But your, your answer to your own version of the question was that the person who retains some humanity, however perverted, was more harmed than the person who does not retain humanity. Right. I mean, that, it sounded like that's, you said that was your answer. Human. I said of Eichmann, I didn't describe him as retaining humanity, but I said he, he was, he remained shame shamelessly and, and shamelessly shamefully. human. Yeah. I mean, what, what, but when but you put I, it I don't with understand using how it, the noun humanity instead of human, it sounds like he retains some kindness. Oh, no, I don't think he retains any kindness. Okay. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, he, he, yeah. But he retains He's some still humanness. He's recognizable as a human being. Yeah. yeah. Whereas and retaining some of that, however perverted, results in this sort of person being more harmed. More harmed, yeah. <laughs> and you said this would not reduce to feeling worse. Right. Can you explain what it is then, if not feeling worse? Like, how are they more harmed in a way that has no reference oh. to how they feel? So it's going to be something they suffer. I want to say, um, well, just straightforwardly, his humanity has been damaged um, in, in a way that, well, it puts an emphasis on the spiritual or psychological aspects of his humanity that Damage to that is worse than damage to the body, I guess you could say. But, uh, but then, you know, that's a harder question than I thought it was at first. Because when you think about the Muslim men, they were damaged both psychologically and physically, but they didn't lose their moral integrity. They simply lost the ability to, to care about any choices at all. Mm -hmm. Whereas Eichmann did not suffer that kind of damage. He's, um, he retains responsibility for his own degradation in a way that the others didn't, and I think that I'm treating that as a kind of, um, 
his humanity suffered a worse harm. Loss. Well, he was complicit in it. Um, yeah. and the others aren't. Well, I could be wrong about this, but it's harder to make a case that the Muslim men are complicit. Some describe them as giving up, and that makes it sound com as yeah. though they're, com uh, they're complicit. Um, uh, and even if they are complicit, they're retaining more, I think, integrity if they'd make that choice because they're unwilling to harm others. Good. So it's, it's the presence of humans. I kind of think about this more, Kate. That's, you know. Uh, me too. But no, that's, <laughs> that's a really good question, uh, explaining that. Yeah, I do all that very quickly at the end. Um, and, oh, I'm sure it will go more slowly in the future. And, yeah. But Alice thinks yeah. she has the answer. Can, yeah. I, mm -hmm. yeah. Can I ask a mm -hmm. question? I wonder if it's, um, mm -hmm. you didn't address this in your answer, but I wonder if it's telling that you start from Aristotle here. So when you talk about survival, mm -hmm. you start from Aristotle on friendship. Yeah. But there's a kind of this Aristotelian flavor to the account of survival you're giving because it's, uh, it, it's surviving physically more than that it's surviving morally and psychologically there's this sense of sort of that there is a, a way of being human that we is better than other ways or mm -hmm. that, and it seems to me that what you're suggesting is mm -hmm. the perversions to, the kinds of identity splitting loss of identity or agency that result from perversion take mm -hmm. us further from that that the kinds of identity and splitting that result to having yeah. to live with your own harms to you and I, I think that's, I mean, you have, that's an arguable case, at least, mm -hmm. if you start from something like an Aristotelian concept of the self or yeah. flourishing. So I had read that into your work. For, for me, it was kind of a revelation, because I've always thought the Gorgias was wrong. You know, the Gorgias <laughs> yeah, I know, was you wrong. Had a yeah. post kantian moment. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, and I do, uh, that, that's helpful, yes, I do think there are degrees of being human, mm -hmm. um, but there is this difference of, complicity in one's own deterioration. Uh, yeah, I think you it, might want to develop kinds of fragmentation or kinds mm -hmm. of splitting. And yeah, well, that's something else the who passes, I wanted that to bring up. Yeah, powerful, I thought. That, um, that Francois brought up, now what was it about, um, oh, the, the splitting and so forth. I didn't, I didn't mean that, again, as an excuse or sort of relieving responsibility. But in fact, in the literature that I'm familiar with on the topic of splitting, there's no consensus about how much responsibility is retained or even whether, to not, uh, whether or not you can hold a person sometimes responsible for deciding to split or for their own splitting or for failing to keep themselves together mm -hmm. so that um, it may not be a, an excuse. That's good. And it sounds like it, uh, um, in uh, Dr. Mueller's case it may be. He made a choice. Um, It's interesting because the court in Canada have a distinction between voluntary and involuntary. Uh, about this, if you know, if you oh. kind of put yourself in that situation. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And very, yes. yes. Is this on? Yes. You can go ahead first if you want. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um, so I was wondering if there can be degrees of atrocities. Yes. Um, the reason why I'm wondering that is because I feel a little uneasy with the idea of the production of survivors. And I feel that um, with the atrocities that you've described, like the Holocaust, for example, mm -hmm. produces very obvious survivors, I would think, for mm -hmm. the most part. Um, but I, I kind of, I'm led to start thinking about Chernobyl and um, what's happening in Japan. And I know that mm -hmm. for the most part, it doesn't seem to fit so clearly into your theory of atrocity, but I kind of want to lead, lean towards the idea that maybe that could be a form of atrocity. You mean the irresponsibility with respect to the nuclear reactor? Yeah. Yes, indeed. Yes. Okay. Yes, and to your first question, yes, indeed, I think, um, uh, some evils are much worse than others, and some atrocities are much worse. And there are many dimensions along which they can be worse, which can make it hard to make comparisons. One may be worse in having more victims, another may be worse in the degree that in, of harm suffered by individuals is more severe. And, and, uh, and, or that one can be worse in that the damage it does is irreversible, and so on. And yeah. so there are many dimensions. So how... Um I mean, stemming from that, I take it that there are degrees of survivors. What do you mean by degrees of survivors? Um, in terms of the harm? 
that they're in terms? Yes, well, I think, yes, survival is a matter of degree. How much is preserved, right? Uh, and how much was the preservation due to what the survivor did? Yeah. Okay. Yes, indeed. Right, thank you. For, for many degrees. Thank you for your questions. Elizabeth, is it? Yes, so thank you. Um, your, when you were talking about the harm to survivors, you talked about the lack or presence of support of others as a factor. Mm -hmm. um, yes. but, but sort of ultimately the analysis was very much on individuals and how they manage and right. how they cope and what the moral damage is to them. And so I wonder if you could say a bit more about the role of others, you know, partly the institutional role you've mentioned, you've responded already to the question about truth and reconciliation commissions and sort of more mm -hmm. formal responses, but what about um, the response of other, the responsibility of other individuals in relation to the damage and the harm. Um, what sort of responsibility do we have individually to respond to individuals? Yes, well, there's a nice question there in a fine line between when you become a perpetrator by failing to assist when you could have, yeah. <laughs> among, and, and when you're just a bystander who morally permissibly didn't do something that could have made a, a difference to the survival of others. Uh, survivors do say pretty much with one voice that nobody could have survived without help, but mostly the help they got was from other um, victims. They helped one another. Yeah. Um, back in the 70s, for a brief time, um, some feminists were exploring the hypothesis that women had a better chance of surviving the Holocaust because of their socialization to help, to you know, be caretakers and so forth. That hypothesis didn't last very long. It emerged very quickly that nobody survived without help. And, that in the, uh, and if you read the survivor accounts, say from Primo Levi and so forth, the men helped one another uh, as well. And they wouldn't have survived without that. Yeah. Um, Just to the outsiders, you know, as individuals, were not in a very good position to make a difference. But as nations, could have, could have. And, and that leads me actually to, to a quick follow-up, which is you, just at the end, you tantalizingly said something about how um, uh, responses to groups who have been victimized, uh, responses to groups who have been victimized could or should reflect on this distinction that you made at the end. Nations. Uh, yes. Been, and, you know, victims of terrorism, like 9-11. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah so, so could you say a bit more about that? Yeah, what I'm thinking of yeah, is the, the way in which the threat of terrorism has been dealt with, say, by the United States and the, with uh, these prisons, uh, Gitmo and the things that are still in existence and the torture and so forth. Um, how much thought is going into the question, at what cost survival, you know? What are the moral costs here? And, and when is it uh, not worth it? And, and what's, going to be, what's going to remain? Um, it's not as though the torture is one thing and then what it saves is another. What it saves is a nation that is willing to torture. You know? Yeah. Yes, and then Violet, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. Hi, I have a quick question. Um, I'm a little uncomfortable with this notion of preservation, mm -hmm. of it being either necessary or sufficient for survival. I don't think it well, is. the degrees of it. Yeah. Even so, I'm, I'm drawn to Bryson's um, book, Aftermath, and I'm, I think, in, in her case especially, that survivor, the title of survivor or surviving was um, dependent on not so much a preservation of a former self, but of a letting go of that former self. And in terms of a uh, transcending um, w this identity that she had or the self that she had, mm -hmm. um, in instead of preserving it, I think that she ran into many difficulties, if I'm reading her correctly, in trying to preserve what she had, um, what had been challenged mm -hmm. because of the atrocities she experienced. So uh, that's my, I guess, my difficulty with our un mm -hmm uncomfortable uh, feelings with the word of preservation. Um, I guess I'm just asking if you could perhaps such some, such some light on that. Um, yeah, uh, yes, I'd be glad to. Um, what I was thinking was such things as, you know, you've survived an atrocity, but you lost your arms and legs. You know, um, is that true survival? What kind of a life do you have? Or you've survived it, but you're um, irreversibly insane. 
Um, if you don't preserve your sanity and your physical integrity, uh, have, you, have you really survived? What has survived? What remains? But I think you've got a very important point that in the process of survival, you may actually grow and develop something that replaces what you had before. That's, that's even, even better. Now, in the case of Susan Bryson, um, she said it took her 10 years before she could write that book. And, that, and writing the book was part of the process of survival. She retained her ability to support herself as a professional philosopher and to okay. do that sort of thing. <laughs> so you've got both okay. preservation and growth. But thank you for that. That, that needs to be factored in. Hi. Hi. In listening to your paper, it made me think a lot about, or I was wondering what the similarities between what you were talking about and the rules of war, mm -hmm. and the kinds of behaviors and conduct that, it, that, would, that are considered more acceptable because of the context of a war going on. Mm -hmm. And typically, it's quite extreme types of behavior. We accept collateral damage to high degrees. Some of us don't. Some, some of it, or, or, but, <laughs> yeah. but often, it, it gets justified. Even very ex extreme things like fire bombings often get justified. Yeah. I, I think that's an atrocity. OK. Mm -hmm. Well, so that I, I wondered about this sort of the different kinds of norms or how you can determine the appropriate kinds of norms given the context. And yeah. is it different? So is atrocity more like war, and or are they all, should we not be looking at it in a completely different context? Yeah. Is it not as different as sort of just our regular norms for the way we should be living our lives anyway? Yeah, that, that gets us into you know, just war theory. What I'm trying to do is, is construct a theory of evil that's compatible with many different ethical theories, which might give you different conclusions about what's justifiable and what isn't. But your question is really, um, to the uh, issue of whether it's wrong to do certain things in the context of war, that it would obviously be wrong to do uh, in another context. And there's quite a well-developed uh, body in all of the major religions around the world addressing those issues. And they're remarkably agreed on what is permissible to do and what is uh, not permissible to do. And in recent times, almost so many of those norms have been violated flagrantly that you can sit there and say, we think that collateral damage, you know, that, that wasn't always um, widely accepted. Yeah. But what has happened during the 20th century is the development of um, weapons of mass destruction, which, if they're used at all, are not going to discriminate between combatants and non-combatants. They should be banned. They should be completely banned. There's war conducted with those things is, is war that has tossed morality out the window. I have uh, two quick questions. Uh, when I, why I spend so much time on blame in, even though you don't want to talk about blame in, in my response, mm -hmm. is that I took it that you wanted to preserve the, the creditable, the praiseworthy aspect, the honorable, the, 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 the matter of pride aspect of survivorship. And if, if you're going to do this, can you really do this without uh, considering the, the, the reverse side of the equation. I want to do like just the opposite. I want to problematize okay. the idea that, survivor, that survivors have won some magnificent prize. I see. OK. <laughs> and and the, the, the other uh, clarificatory remark, and, and that was brought to mind by this comment, can a, can a, a, a torturer, somebody who is a, a, a perpetrator of atrocity, who is himself or herself subjected to atrocity, and therefore, and manages to preserve himself, quay himself, which right. one? The, the torturer? The, 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 tor the, tor the torturer. The torturer who is tortured and preserves himself through or herself through that process, qua torture, as that person survives. Does the, 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 the moral mm -hmm. praiseworthiness or, or, or soundness of the individual This is a good question, yeah. I went to a torture conference at... Um, uh, yes, <laughs> at the University of California at, at Fullerton. Well, that was the theme of the whole conference. And two survivors, um, who are not philosophers, uh, presented their experience. Uh, one had been tortured when he was um, a student in Colombia, was suspected of being a communist and so forth. And the other one, I don't know the particulars of, uh, of her history. But they have worked with torturers 
And torturers are definitely, in many cases, the torturers they worked with, survivors of the experience of being a torturer. Mm -hmm. It does terrible things to the psyche of a person. Who begins. And something I didn't know before that I learned from this was that many torturers, the hands-on people who actually apply the instruments, are themselves survivors of torture. Mm -hmm. That's how they learned how to do it. Mm -hmm. That's how they learned how much a person can take before they're going to break, and so on and so forth. Um, and they learned, you know, what's terrifying and so on. Yeah. So that, yes, being a torturer is, uh, well, in this case, th they wouldn't have chosen this job if they'd had a viable alternative. But being tortured leaves you so badly damaged that you're not good for very many jobs. And this is one they know how to do well. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it's very damaging. It further damages the people who do it. But, but the question is, somebody is very evil in the first place. And suffer, they suffer evil. Mm -hmm yet managed to outlive that evil and mm -hmm. remain as bad as they were before. Mm -hmm. Have they survived? Well, they haven't survived. Uh, their integrity hasn't survived. But they didn't yes. have any. They, they're as, oh, they oh, didn't I have see. any in the first oh, so place. There's, so right? there's so, nothing to preserve. So, right? so exactly. And I'm oh, just there's nothing so. to preserve. Uh, have they survived? I'm just trying to gauge how much evaluation goes on. In the, yeah, yeah, in yeah. The, I'm assuming a certain basic humanity gets destroyed by the atrocity, but maybe it wasn't there in the first place. I should acknowledge that, that, okay. that in some cases there may be nothing worth preserving. Okay. Yeah. Um, in uh, talking about whether or not someone has uh, survived, you mentioned that one of the things that we should look at is whether or not they come out with um, a uh, life that's worth living. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering if that's an objective evaluation or a subjective evaluation or a combination of both. Oh, I meant from, the, from their own point of view. Okay. You know, it may be clear that they're, they're not worth anything to anybody else, but from their own point of view, and that's why I bring up the suicides at the end, the people who have decided this. It's not worth it. Right. Thanks. If there are no others, I have one last question. Sorry. Um, this, I know that I shouldn't hog you. I just have one other question. I now am thinking about Francoise and my sort of stubborn refusal to let you not talk about blame. And so I have <laughs> so I have one more question about blame. And that's not about blame that philosophers do, but it's about blaming as a practice that um, a survivor might do. Mm -hmm. And I've been thinking about yeah. the, your response to Susan, who said that the thing doing all the work in distinguishing survivals of, survivors of evil is the particular moral costs and burdens. Mm -hmm. And then I found myself thinking about, first of all, pushing you on excusable wrongs. And I thought, OK. So in one way, um, someone who is a survivor of intolerable harm at the hands of someone, but it's an excusable wrong for some reason. I'm, I'm not, I don't come up with good okay. examples on like, the spot. Like Francois' um, example, yeah. Well, this perhaps a situation of accidental friendly fire or some, something like that, mm -hmm. um, or um, a, a sort of parallel case where there's some sort of understandable irresponsibility. People aren't genuinely aware of the risks of some mm -hmm. sort of practice, and someone gets horrifically, traumatically, intolerably harmed as a result of it. That they may actually, there may be at least one kind of burden or cost that they face that they're survivors of evils that are evils in your definition don't, and that is that they don't have a target for resentment or anger or blame. Mm -hmm. And there's been a lot of work, feminist work done on the empowering effects of, a, of, effects of anger and the mm -hmm. importance of anger for self-respect. And I mm -hmm. found myself thinking that wow. faith, surviving without having a place to put anger may lead to particular moral risks, costs, and dangers because the obvious response is to put it on the wrong people or yourself. Yes. But mm -hmm. So those, that's a very interesting, the survivors yes. of near evil mm -hmm. may pose a very interesting risk, a very interesting question for you. Yes, survivors of well, things I'm not that quite are, sure to call, you know, what to call it. You'll have to survivors right of, term. yeah, of uh, catastrophes that are not evils. Survivors mm -hmm. of Katrina, for example, who weren't victims of the police officers who fled, but were just victims of the... Yeah, I don't know whether I know that that's not yeah. an evil, actually. <laughs> yeah. Well, there are, there, but yes. yeah, mm -hmm. when the levees broke, right? Yeah, um, exactly. <laughs> but, uh, or I pick another, uh, yeah. a tornado that happened the other day. It may, that may not be an evil. Or even uh, something closer mm -hmm. where, I mean, where excuses play, where it's at human hands, but excuses okay. play the kind of role that push it just far enough away from your definition. It's, it's not it's, an evil, yeah. But, but there's still but people the, involved, yeah. yeah. Uh, <clears throat> the moral cost of 
But yeah, there may be moral challenges to be faced there. Uh, on, and I suppose the connection with blame is they want to blame somebody. They need somebody to blame, but there may be no appropriate target yeah, to blame. And yeah, and they've mm -hmm. lost the kind of moral orientation that practices of blame can give. Mm -hmm. So figuring out, I, I didn't deserve that to happen to me, and therefore so-and-so was wrong to do it. That mm -hmm. kind of distancing, backing, and forthing can be very important for regaining a sense of mm -hmm. moral values and integrity and all of these things that you're talking about that get preserved in mm -hmm. true survival. So it may actually in some ways be harder for mm -hmm. someone to survive when they lose that, that one strategy for mm -hmm. sort of regaining integrity and autonomy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. something to yeah. well, and something that I didn't point out is I agree with you about uh, the passage in Arendt that's a very important passage about not abdicating mm -hmm. the making of judgments. Yeah. yeah. But there's one thing I think um, I'm, I'm reluctant to do that she's not because she's Jewish and she's also a survivor. Mm -hmm. yeah. She's willing to blame the members of the Judenrat <laughs> for what yeah, they no, did. Yeah. And um, it, it may be appropriate for her to do so in a way that would not be appropriate for me to do so. Yeah, one, one last question, Mr. Okay. Um, your, your recent uh, point that you just made kind of reminded me to look back at Japan right now and, you know, ineptability on the parts of people who know something. Mm -hmm. Now, the catastrophe was environmentally based. We as humans do not really have control over it, but is there not the ability and capability for people in their knowing and not telling or informing to create that situation into an act of evil? Mm -hmm. and? inadvertently they are directing it on everybody who is affected. It may not be a specific target group, but it's anybody in a given area. So there isn't really much of a differential there. It wasn't targeted to begin with, but it becomes a target by them not responding and not stepping up to save the lives that could potentially be harmed. So one of the sad things about what's happened in Japan recently is that they've discovered stones that were placed a hundred or more years ago by survivors of tsunamis. Warning, do not build your houses beyond this point. And for a long time people didn't and then they started to do it and all those houses were wiped out. Thank you. Thank you. Please join in thanking uh, Claudia and Alice and, and thank you. <laughs> And to all our visitors, again, thank you for joining us. Also.